Hey everyone, thank you for joining me on a very special edition of Ask a Spaceman. I have a very special guest today, but this is part two of a collab video. To watch part one, you need to follow the link that's right down there. There'll also be a card in one of these corners, and then there'll also be a link to the video at the end of this, which would mean you'd be watching it out of order, but that's okay. Part one is about the long-term fate of the universe and some strange stars that are going to pop up in a few trillion years or so. This is part two where my special guest, John Michael Godier, who has an amazing YouTube channel, which you absolutely need to subscribe to. He's here to talk with me about some strange stars that are in the here and now. Thank you so much for joining me, John Michael Godier. It's a pleasure to be here, Paul. Hey, can I say you have a really fun name to say? <laughs> it just, it, it really flows off the tongue. John Michael Godier. Yes, it's uh, it's it's um, it's easy to say. Easy to say. There you go. So you want to talk about some weird stars? What's your top number one weird star for us today? Oh, that's easy. This star is called Jabilsky's star. Jabilsky's, and is not p spelled how it's pronounced. Nothing like it. Um, it's a Polish surname, and those can always be tricky. Um, in this case, this star contains, or appears to contain, it, you know, not, not proven yet, appears to contain transuranic elements. Now, in the 1960s, Carl Sagan and uh, a Soviet colleague of his, um, uh, Josef Shklovsky, uh, I think his name was, they came up with the idea, oh, no. yes, something like that. Um, they came up with the idea that if you ever saw something like plutonium in a star's uh, makeup, if you saw that that spectra of it. It could be that aliens were putting it there on purpose and essentially announcing their existence to space. Now this has oh, become- it's not for fun. There is a reason for it. Um, now, more recently with things like the kilonova, where we see all sorts of heavy elements being produced by neutron star mergers, what does this, what, what caused this star? How might it have gotten those transuranic elements in its makeup, especially ones with very, very short half-lives? Yeah, this is pretty interesting because Jabilsky's star is one kind of star of a general class that we call peculiar stars, which as you pointed out, peculiar stars have some extra heavy elements that we don't normally see in a star. There's some other peculiarities about Jabilsky's star. It pulsates every 12 minutes. It gets brighter and dimmer, brighter and dimmer every 12 minutes. And it also seems to be moving faster than its neighbors, like it's not really connected to its local stellar system. So what's going on with peculiar stars in general? Maybe because of that high velocity, maybe it encountered a supernova, which sprinkled it with some of these heavier elements and then it got kicked out of the system. Maybe it has something to do with the pulsations, which we think are driven by strong magnetic fields. So maybe material is getting dredged up from the interior of the star and put up on the surface where we can actually see these elements. Um, but like you said, with Shabilsky's star, there are some very short half-life elements that we see. So what's going on? Maybe we're just lucky. Maybe we just happen to catch the one star in the galaxy that has some elements of detectable quantities on its surface that has a half-life of a thousand years and we just spot it at just the right time. You know, considering this is the, the only star we've seen like this, that's actually a pretty strong contender. Maybe there's some more exotic physics going on. Maybe there has a hidden companion that we don't know about, like a bright neutron star that's bombarding it with high energy radiation and causing some extra fission pro infusion processes. Maybe there's something to do with what we call the island of stability, where there's some very heavy elements past the end of the periodic table that are relatively stable and then they decay. And maybe this is an example of nature producing those elements and then this is what we get. Maybe. Now, say that's happening. Okay, you're getting them. These, these elements are being um, injected into this star by a neutron star. Now, would that be going through the island of stability? Be would would that be neutronium that is is um, uh, degrading down through the island of stability? Or what would happen to neutronium if you pulled it off of a neutron star? What would neutronium do? 
Right, so neutronium is a ball of neutrons, and a neutron star is a giant ball of neutrons. If you rip some of those neutrons off and disassociate them, it turns out neutrons themselves decay in like a dozen minutes. They are not stable by themselves. They're only stable if they're bound to other things, like bound inside of a nucleus or bound inside of a neutron star. Once you start ripping individual neutrons off, they start decaying very, very rapidly. So what might be the cause of these heavier elements uh, because of a companion at Zhabilsky star wouldn't be the neutrons themselves, but the high energy radiation, the X-ray rays and gamma rays bombarding that surface at close range, uh, creating some extra fission process and making and sprinkling it with some, some heavy stuff. So would the neutronium actually just become neutral hydrogen after the neutrons decayed? Right after the neutrons decay, uh, they actually decay into their constituent particles. Uh, oh, what are the decay products of neutron? I think it turns it back into a proton, uh, and then uh, a, I believe an electron and a neutrino is what neutron uh, decays into. But I'm not 100% sure without looking it up right now. Right, right. Another strange star, and I recently covered this on my channel, is uh, HD 140283, which on the upper end has a number that actually exceeds the age of the universe, um, higher than 13.8 uh, billion years. Of course, it's within the margin of error. Right. Right. Now, what's going on with this star? Is this one of the universe's first stars or? Right. This is this is an incredibly old star, right? It's nicknamed the Methuselah star after the biblical character. And this is perhaps the oldest star in our nearby system. It certainly wasn't the first star amongst the first stars to come online in the universe. That's because those very first stars were pure hydrogen, pure helium. There was no heavier elements laying around. Those didn't last long. Those all died off. But the next generation that did have some of those fusion products, some carbon, some oxygen, some even some iron, uh, were contaminated the early universe. And so the second generation of stars were born with that. And the sig spectral signature of this star suggests it does have some of those heavier elements. So it's not the first generation, but perhaps the first star in the second generation, which still makes it super duper old. So this would be a second generation star. Um, so the first generation star would have had to have lived and gone supernova very rapidly. Um, I take it for this star to be that old to, and to be a second generation star. So it essentially formed from the remnants of some of the first supernovas in, ever to occur in the universe. Yeah, that's the thought. And now uh, a little bit on the age on this, it, it's very, very hard to pin down the age of one particular star with any great accuracy. Because you, it's hard to tell, is that a uh, a small star that looks old or a big star that looks young or you know, vice versa? Uh, but we do know the distance to this star. And so we know it's, it's luminosity, it's true brightness, and we know it's metallicity. We know what its chemical composition is. That allows us to place it on the Hertzsprung-Reissel diagram and kind of extrapolate an age for the star. And like you said, the number you get here is 14.4 billion years old, but every measurement in science comes with uncertainty and you have to quote the uncertainty with the number. And in this case, it's 14.4 plus or minus 0.8 billion years at the one sigma level or plus or minus 1.6 billion years at the two sigma level, which is totally 100% consistent with our estimate from cosmological sources of the age of the universe at 13.8 billion years. I should say 13.8 plus or minus 0.1. So this star probably is very low in, in metal, right? Yes, incredibly low, much lower than the sun. So that and that's a result of just only having one supernova's worth of metal to uh, have in its composition. Uh, yeah. What what does that do to the star? Does that make it stranger or m more different than say a star that formed you know five billion years after the Big Bang? 
Actually, once the, the first generation of stars to come online that were pure hydrogen, pure helium, they did behave slightly differently than later generations of stars. But once you enter that second generation, once you add a little bit of contamination, the population of stars when the universe is say 500, billion, 500 million years old isn't much different than the population of stars today. Obviously the average metallicity, the average contamination changes, but in terms of life cycles and colors and sizes, it's pretty much the same population. I see. Now the Big Bang created hydrogen, uh, helium, and lithium, correct? Yes. What role does lithium play in these early stars? It doesn't. Nobody cares about lithium. <laughs> you get rid of all the lithium in the universe, and I don't think anyone would notice. Sorry, lithium. Except the chemists. They would notice. I suppose, but would they know there was no lithium? There oh, you, you blew my mind. You blew There's my mind. Right. There you go. There you go. <laughs> It's because uh, the Big Bang, uh, lithium just isn't produced in any significant quantities, even in the Big Bang, even in the very early nucleosynthesis of the universe, uh, and then later generations of stars, there aren't a lot of fusion reactions or fission reactions that lead to lithium. So it's always just kind of hanging out there, uh, the, the, the element that nobody cares about. Yes, yes. Well, unless you actually have metallic lithium because it's really reactive. Um, okay, okay, there's, there's an example. There is that. It's, it's, it's not just hanging around, it's reacting. Um, the next star is one that's, this is a type of star that I'm particularly interested in because it holds some implications on the development of life in the universe. Mm -hmm. This is, these are called carbon stars and they're essentially stars that belch carbon. What's going on here? Ah, okay. So we know that stars fuse elements in their cores, right? So the sun is turning hydrogen into helium in its core as we speak, unless you're watching this on YouTube 5 billion years from now, in which case that's no longer a true statement. But 5 billion years from now, or in the case of more massive stars near the ends of their lives, the helium core starts fusing and turning into carbon and oxygen. And usually that carbon and oxygen stays in a lump in the core because it's heavy and it sinks and it makes a core. But during the red giant phase of a star, this core is surrounded by a thick envelope that's very active. There's lots of convection cells, just like there's convection cells in a boiling pot of water. In the same way that boiling water will take water that's at the bottom of the pot and move it to the top and vice versa, these convection cells can grab onto some carbon and some oxygen pull it up to the surface, and then because the surface of a red giant is so far away from the core, there's not a lot of gravity there, so they can even be expelled, and it can spew, it can sprinkle carbon throughout its system. Now, can that, can that carbon block light? Like, for example, you know, in like Kepler data, can we actually see carbon stars blocking starlight? Oh, we, it's not like it blocks like it. You'd, you'd see the star be dimmer, but we can see the spectral lines of emission and absorption of carbon sitting in the outer layers, the outer atmospheres of these stars, which is exactly how we identify them. Now, once that carbon has been expelled from the star, it's got to go somewhere. And mm -hmm. we see, it goes yes, it goes into space. And once it does that, carbon, of course, is the basis of organic chemistry. And... Mm -hmm. How, does, how do we go from a carbon star to organic chemistry? Well, that question is above my pay grade because that's something for the biologists. I, we, we really don't know. We honestly don't know how you go from inorganic chemistry uh, to, to life, to, to the building blocks of life. One particular suggestion, one idea, one path is that carbon hooks up with hydrogen to make something called polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, or PAHs, and these form uh, scaffolds. They form structures. And these themselves, by themselves, aren't very interesting, but this might provide a scaffold for RNA to start doing its little chemistry dance. And then once you have RNA in place, it can lead into DNA, and once you have DNA, then the whole game of life gets started. So 
these stars that are expelling carbon, the carbon mixes up with the hydrogen, which is all over the place, gives us these PAHs, and we actually see these PAHs all over the place. And so maybe the scaffolding that led to life was formed in these carbon stars, which is pretty cool. So it's not like life itself was formed in these stars. It's not the panspermia kind of thing. It's more like maybe the building blocks that led to what would lead to life formed in the environments of these massive stars. Now we even find those uh, within meteorites, don't we? So, certain yes. types? Yes, yeah, so we find PAHs in the crust of the Earth. We find it, find it in meteorites. We find it in Martian meteorites. We see it in nebulas in space. We see it around stars. Turns out PAHs are very common, which isn't surprising because hydrogen is element number one in the universe. Carbon is fused in every star at the end of its life. And eventually the carbon and hydrogen, they're gonna find each other and do some interesting things. All right, the next one, um, oblate stars. Um, actually, very famous example of this would be Vega. And these stars are- I didn't know this. I didn't know that Vega was an oblate star. It is, it is. And it's uh, these are stars that are crushed, you know, um, by their, their rotation into sort of an oblate shape. And it causes differences in brightness. These stars are brighter at certain points in their makeup than they are at other points. Um, can, you, can you tell us about that? Right, so if a star like Vega is spinning very, very rapidly, then just like what happens with the Earth a little bit, the Earth is a little bit fatter around the middle, and then Saturn spins super fast, so it's pretty, it's pretty oblate itself. Same thing can happen to stars where you get some oblateness. Now, this has an interesting effect in stars that you don't see in planets. The poles that are squashed they sit closer to the center of the star, so they experience slightly stronger gravity. And with, to counteract that slightly stronger gravity to maintain the hydrostatic equilibrium to make a stable star, there has to be an increased pressure in increased temperature, which makes the poles hotter. Another way to look at it, an alternative way that's perfectly equivalent, is that the equator, since, they're further, since the equator is further away from the core, it has slightly less gravity, so it's a little bit cooler. And so the poles are brighter than the equators on these stars, and not by a little bit. We're talking like a factor of five brighter on the poles than the equator. I see, so significantly different. You would see it with your eyeball. But if you but don't look at a star close up. But if you put on your eclipse glasses, you could see it. Yes. Now, is there an entire class of these types of stars based on how fast they're spinning? I mean, are these classified as you know? Um, I mean, do they behave differently if they're spinning really, really fast as opposed to one that's spinning enough to be oblate, but um, not not as fast as you know as it could. Well, there, what's the interesting thing about these kinds of stars is they're spinning really fast. Like Vega spins uh, in a few hours, compare that to 24 days for the sun. So we expect stars to have all sorts of different rotation periods and that's not surprising. But when you get to these kinds of stars that are spinning so fast, they're right up against the edge of their own breakup velocity where if they were just to spin a little bit more, they would literally tear themselves apart from the centrifugal forces. And we're not exactly sure how a star gets spun up so fast because stars slow down as they age. Well, if you have a long-lived massive star like Vega and it's going super fast and it couldn't have been faster in the past, otherwise it would have torn itself apart, that means it used to be slower and then at some point it spun up and we're not exactly sure how that process happens. Interesting. The next one is probably our weirdest type of star. It's HV2001, which is thought to be an object, or a very strange object, called a Thorn Zeitkow object. Uh, what's going on here? All right, so uh, Thorn Zeitkow objects in general are when you have two stars born together, 
one bigger than the other. So the bigger one lives its life, goes, becomes a red giant, maybe goes supernova, does its thing, leaves behind a neutron star core. Then the other one, the lower mass one, finally catches up in its stage of evolution, enters a red giant phase. Maybe the outer envelope of that red giant uh, starts to accrete onto the neutron star. Maybe they can spiral in towards each other. And maybe sometimes the neutron star can actually go inside of the red giant, then settle down in its core. Now, the thing is, and, and so that's the definition of a thorn zygote object, is a neutron star buried inside of a red giant. The thing is, from the outside, you couldn't tell the difference. Red giant stars are so big and already have very dense cores, if you plopped a neutron star into one, you probably couldn't tell the difference, except through some very subtle effects of some elements on their surface. Because that neutron star is so hot, just like we were talking about with Jabilsky's object, it can emit high energy radiation, which can trigger some extra fusion and fission reactions at that boundary between the neutron star and the inner part of the red giant. So you get some extra, say, lithium contamination that you don't normally see. And then because the red giant atmosphere is active, there's these convection cells that can dredge up material from the depths, put it at the surface where we can see it with our telescopes. And so this particular object is potentially one potentially one because we do see some extra elements in its surface that we don't normally see. Okay, so now this neutron star that's sitting in the center of a red giant, one of the weird things it's fusing is lithium, right? Who would have guessed, right? Yes, lithium, lithium makes a comeback. Yeah, but we still don't care about it. Sorry, lithium. <laughs> but there's also molybdenum and rubidium, which are little, probably a little bit more interesting because those are somewhat scarce. Honestly, anything's more interesting than lithium. <sighs> All right, let's see. We're not even using them for batteries much anymore, are we? We're starting to move away from that. Yeah, it's, it's, it's losing its usefulness there too. Let's see, it has medical uses, as I recall, um, or compounds of it do. And you can catch things on fire with it. It, ex it explodes if you throw it in water. Oh, now you're now you're interesting. Now you have my attention. It does. Yes, lithium and um, lithium is is highly reactive in water. Um, and so is sodium if you get them in metallic form. Yeah. So you can you really do some damage with lithium if you got it. Uh, you have to actually keep it inside of uh, mineral oil so that it doesn't react. Oh, that's right. That's right. Yes. Mmm. Good to know. Next time I have carry some around if you really want to blow something up with a whole lot of and you got a whole lot of lithium on your hands you you could you could get it done and now this video is flagged thank you very much <laughs> well, well to be honest with you everything i do gets flagged anymore um youtube has gotten a little bit crazy with the uh algorithms as of late oh for sure all right the next star rx j1856.5-3754 um this is something that could be could be and i'm going to stress that a quark star and is it a quark star or is it just a neutron star that we don't have a good model for because there is some question there where the transition between the two is um so what do you think this is i don't know <laughs> <laughs> no, we don't know. And that's the great thing. Uh, we honestly don't know. So neutron stars are supported by degeneracy pressure, by the very fact that you can only put so many neutrons in a box before they won't go any, they won't squeeze any tighter. And so the physics of that, how we understand this quantum mechanical effect to work, put some constraints on what could possibly be the size and the brightness of a neutron star. We're getting this from very fundamental physics. And it's thought that if you do try to squeeze a neutron star too much, it won't turn into anything else. It'll just catastrophically collapse and turn into a black hole. But maybe, 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 if you squeeze a neutron star a lot, but not too much, you can make a new kind of object known as a quark star, which are supported by a completely different set of quantum mechanical effects at a deeper level. And maybe, maybe, maybe in the core of every neutron star sits a quark 
ball supported by its own degeneracy pressure. We're not too sure on that. The physics of the interior of a neutron star is horrendously complicated because we don't understand nuclear physics to that level of detail, or we don't understand quantum mechanics uh, and quantum physics to that level of detail. So what's going on with some examples of neutron stars that don't quite fit the mold? Is it a case of, no, this really is a neutron star, but you know the theorists back in the lab don't really understand neutron physics? Or is it the case of a new kind of star that's brand new? We don't know. We don't know. It would almost have to be a very rare situation, though, regardless to form one of these, wouldn't you think? Oh, for sure, for sure. Uh, because you have to get it just right. It's like Goldilocks. Like, you know, we know we can produce neutron stars just fine. And you know, if you apply too much gravity, then you get the black hole. But maybe there's this thin little window where you can get some other exotic objects. I see. Now, would this, uh, would this connect back up with, with spin, stellar spin? Could a star, a rapidly spinning quark star, be holding itself together just by its spin to keep it just at the edge of, of collapse? I think, and I'm just guessing here, I'm thinking that the quark or even neutron star degeneracy pressure, the pressure uh, that supports its weight against gravity that uh, prevents it from collapsing into a black hole, is orders of magnitude stronger than any pressure support supported by rotation itself. This isn't a gas, it's not like a nebula cloud, it's not like a star. Uh, it's more like it's more like a planet where the electro if you think of the Earth, what's keeping the Earth together from collapsing is the electrostatic pressure of rocks. It's not our spin. We could stop the Earth's spin dead in its tracks and it would still hold itself up. So I think it's an analogous situation. I see, I see. Um, another kind of fascinating star actually comes up on the list here. Extremely close binary stars mm -hmm. that are actually in some cases even touching. Um, Probably the most famous example of this would be M. Y. Camelopardalis. What eventually happens when you have two stars so close to each other that they're touching? Yeah, that's the crazy thing. And, and it's crazy to think about. This is such a sci-fi scenario and I love it. You could actually visit some systems that we know of where the stars are so close together that they've begun to share an atmosphere where they, they're almost kissing. They're kissing and there's like a tunnel of gas between the two stars as they orbit in this very, very tight binary. And so that would just be extreme to look at. That'd be such a fun thing to see up close uh, right in there in the system. Eventually, when those systems occur, they eventually merge together completely. That leads to, as you might imagine, a catastrophic explosion and expulsion of material in a big light show. What happens after that, we're not exactly sure. And that's because we're, there's not much known about post-merger events one, because we don't have a lot of examples. Uh, this isn't exactly a common thing in the universe, so we don't have a lot of data. And two, it's because the physics of this system are incredibly complicated. So it's difficult to simulate. It's difficult to make predictions. It's difficult to understand. So what's, the, what's life like after two stars merge? There's a few options, and they're all pretty interesting. So these are... Let's see, I, if, I'm, if I'm not mistaken, and don't quote me on this, these are orange dwarfs, aren't they, in that particular system? I am not gonna quote you because uh, I'm pretty sure, I do know that when they do merge, they're known as uh, luminous red uh, nova, or red luminous nova, or something like that. It's a, a class of cataclysmic variable star, a class of nova uh, that aren't quite as bright as a typical nova. So I know that, but I like the I like the name Orange Dwarf. I like that, like an Oompa Loompa. Well, what? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, what I'm thinking is okay. We're studying mergers of things like neutron stars and black holes, but when you're looking at the merger of stars, that would probably be that probably wouldn't be enough mass to be able to detect uh, gravitational waves from that kind of a merger, wouldn't you think? Yeah, probably not. You have to get up into neutron star or 
maybe white dwarf territory before you can do it with uh, earth-based instruments with stars merging uh, they just they just don't shake space time enough you would need a giant detector in space effectively in 500 years time to even get close to this um, oh God, yeah. yeah well that just about wraps it up thanks for listening i am john michael godier and I'm Paul Sutter, and this is Ask a Spaceman, but you need to go to John Michael Godier's channel. He has such amazing, fun to watch content. John, why don't you tell everyone more about what they can find on your channel? I talk about SETI, uh, the search for life in the universe from a science standpoint and the standpoint of a science fiction author. And I also talk about basically anything weird that's going on in the universe. Very cool. Everyone go there right now.